Quick question. What's better than one Yag Panther? Two Yag Panthers. Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a double feature model showcase video for a pair of these 135th scale German Jagd Panther tank destroyers. The two models that you see in this video are built for my own personal collection and are not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention in these build videos, I frequently take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. For availability and pricing information, that information would be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. Both of these models here are built predominantly out of the box. However, during the course of construction, I went ahead and made several modifications to the base starter kits, as well as adding some extra pieces of detailing. We'll be going over all these modifications and alterations that were made to these two kits here, as well as giving them a thorough in-box review. So stay tuned because there's going to be a bunch of info coming right at you. Before we continue with the video, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around these two models. And these two vehicles are an example of the STKFC 173 Jagd Panther. The Jagd Panther was a German tank destroyer that was designed during World War II, and it mounted a very large high velocity anti tank gun onto a Panther chassis. The idea of the Jag Panther really picks up where the elephant left off. The Germans during World War II, they kind of had this knack on wanting to create a very heavily armed tank destroyer that was using a pre-existing chassis but mounted a really high velocity anti-tank gun in order to deal with armor threats. Although the Germans had a heavy tank which would have utilized the 88mm gun and have sufficient armor to duke it out with tanks when they were engaging them, the Germans also wanted to have a tank to act as a sniper type role in order to pick tanks off at very long ranges. This type of idea was utilized on vehicles like the Dicker Max or the Nashorn where they took a Panzer IV chassis and played around with it in order to mount on the long high velocity gun. However, unlike those vehicles, the Jagd Panther was going to be unique because it was going to have very thick armor protection on it as opposed to the other vehicles which were relatively thin skinned. Automotive wise, the Jagd Panther utilized the exact same chassis as the standard Panther of the period. The chassis was not lengthened or any other changes that were made to it and the vehicles were still going to be propelled by the HL230 Maybach engine. Although, unlike the Panther, which utilized its armament in a fully revolving turret, the Jagd Panther was going to have a casemate type design, which had limited transverse capabilities compared to the fully revolving turret, which can, of course, rotate 360 degrees. For the type of role that this vehicle was going to be utilized for, the need for a fully revolving turret was deemed not to be necessary, as again, it was intended to just snipe and pick out tanks from long distances. The vehicle's frontal armor was going to be 80 millimeters, which was a very good thickness in armor protection. And in combination with that, just like with the standard Panther, the Yag Panther utilized an all sloping design. For the main armament, the vehicle utilized the 8.8 pack 43-3 anti-tank gun, which had a very effective armor piercing capabilities and was one of the best anti-tank guns of the war. These vehicles were produced from 1943 all the way up to the end of the war in 45, and a good number of them were produced, about 415 in total. One design element that the Germans incorporated into the Jagd Panthers from day one that was a lesson learned from the Ferdinand was that the Elephant was going to have a secondary armament. The secondary armament consisted of an MG34T, which was mounted in a fully armored pivoting ball type system. With the combination of the mobility, the armor protection, the main gun that was also paired with some really great optics, this made the Jagd Panther a very formidable opponent. If this vehicle was encountered in an ambush type setting, it was going to be very difficult in order to deal with this threat. The only way really to deal with a vehicle like this is to try to outmaneuver it by getting to its flanks, or you could do what the US military did by and large, which would be to shell the ever loving hell out of the area that the vehicle would be reported in. Of all the German World War II tanks that survived the war, there are a decent number of Jagd Panthers that are still in existence. A large number of them are housed in military museums all over the world, and there are even a few of them that are in private collections. Many of these vehicles are also in fully operational and running condition. 
And here are the models at the start of the build. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing two identical Yacht Panther tank destroyer kits from Metallery. Just like with my last double feature video where I utilized two Tamiya M113 FSB kits that were sitting in the stash for a while, this video here is going to be basically similar. Both of these kits were sitting in the stash for basically, again, another 10 or 14 years or so, so it's about time I finally get to them. Which definitely explains why there's just so much filth found on the surface of the box. If I rub away some more dust, you can finally see a box art under there, so... Yeah, it's a good thing I finally got to them because I really want to make some space in the shop, so it's about time I get these ones built. Well, since both of these kits are the exact same models, no point occupying the table space for both of them. So we'll start with the one with the cleaner box. And cleaner, I'm using that term loosely because even though this one was sitting on the bottom of the other one, you can see it's still plenty filthy. Regardless, these models here were released by Italeri in the mid-1990s, specifically the 1994 time frame. These kits here are nothing more than an add-on to the new tooling Italeri Panther G kits that came out at around the same time. For anyone who's a frequent viewer of my smaller scale model showcase videos, you'll know that the 1990s time frame was not exactly the best time to be an armor modeler. There was just not a whole wide selection of kits that were on the market at that time. When it came to the bigger companies like Tamiya or Italeri, they were mostly just coasting on the releases that have been in constant production since really the mid-1970s or so. Italeri specifically were just reboxing many of their older legacy kits like their M47 Patton or their Panzer IV series. However, in the mid-1990s, Italeri decided to bust out of that trend and start tooling up new kits utilizing new technology and vehicles that weren't being touched by the other companies of the time. And to put things in perspective to my Zoomer audience out there, yes, during the 1990s, a Jagd Panther M135 scale was considered new and groundbreaking material. And to set the stage, if you were looking for a 135 scale Jagd Panther in the 1990s, your only other option was from Tamiya. No, not that kit, it would have been this one. This kit here was designed in the 1970s and utilized the exact same lower hull components as the Tamiya Panther A kit of the same era. Oddly enough, I've done a video review of that kit and it can be found on the channel. As fun as that kit is, however, by the 1990s time frame, it was woefully inadequate and was really showing its age. So again, a Panther or Yak Panther of new production tooling was something that was desperately appreciated by the market. It's also important to point out that around this time, Tamiya themselves were also retooling and coming up with new versions of Panthers and Yak Panthers, and these kits would be dropping around the same time as this kit over here. However, I'm pretty sure that a few of my audience members are muttering to their computer screens right now or smashing into the comment section. Yes, John, that's nice and handy, but what about Dragon? They're known for their German tank kits and Dragon kits are the bomb. Well, the answer is you're absolutely correct. However, you have to keep in mind that at this time, the Dragon kits were nothing more than the Italeri tooling here, just with some polished up runners on them. And this can also be seen on many of my other vintage Dragon builds of the same era, which are also found on the ECA channel. So the mid-90s were really between Italeri and Tamiya duking out on who had the better Panther and Yag Panther family. The Tamiya kits are exquisitely made, but even up until today, they aged pretty well. And the Italeri kits, in my opinion, did so as well. However, one advantage that the Italeri kits did have over the Tamiya ones were cost. The Tamiya kits, when they were retooled, brand new, retail for about 40 to, I want to say, 60 US dollars at the time. These kits here were about 20 to 30 bucks a piece, so they were much more affordable compared to their Tamiya counterparts. The detailing on them were basically on par with each other, give or take one kit here has better detailing on this side as opposed to on that side with this piece versus that piece. And you could argue about the minutia all day long and they basically do on the forms. But by and large, these kits here were a new entry into the 135th scale market and really set the stage for what was gonna be built upon them as the decades progressed from this era. 
These kits here are still in production and can be found on a multitude of retailers since Italy does have some very good distribution. They can be found on eBay, local hobby shops, e-tailers, model shows, you name it, they're fairly easy to come by. This particular unit here is actually a recent re-release because of the way the box art is illustrated. The original box art on the mid-1990s release of the Italian Yag Panther utilizes the exact same box art but has slightly different typography. Namely, this blue banner and yellow stripe here are not found on those boxes and you have this weird typeface, which if anyone knows the Tallery Kits, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. It kind of has like the like vortexing drop shadow thing to it. It's an Italian thing. In recent years, they switched to the layout that we have here, and this is found on all of the recent releases of Italian Kits that are being produced up until today. Well, I guess we might as well start with the box art. Here we have a winter schemed Yag Panther. Somewhere on the eastern front, note the plethora of knocked out T3476s in the background. Quality illustration is pretty decent. You have some good rendering here on the tracks, road wheels, and the vehicle by and large is in good proportions. Quality of the box art is quite typical for what you would see on other works used by Italian. Unfortunately, there's no artist signature found on the corners like is typically seen on many other box arts. Like I said before, this is the newer version of this release due to the bluer banner that we have here, the Italian logo. This is kit number 6275. On the side of the box here, we have a panel with some brief information. Note the plethora of languages that are found on the side of the box. Shows you all the markets that Italy does sell their kits in. Side panel here, just a nice little abbreviated thumbnail of the kit. Gives you the dimensions, which is nice. It's 28.8 centimeters in case that doesn't come out on screen. And here we have just a couple quick thumbnails of a pre-built sample. Note this is, they're basically recommending you use Model Master and this is when Model Master Acrylic was coming out. Other relevant information, legal mumbo jumbo and the barcode. Note 2005 was when the re-release here was. Well, with all that mumbo jumbo all the way, let's go ahead and crack the model open. Inside the box here, you're gonna find a no frills, bare bone plastic model kit. All the components are made from injection molded polystyrene. The only exception of course being the track bands which are made from flexible vinyl. For anyone who's built a number of Italian kits, this here should look absolutely familiar with no surprises. Starting with the tracks, oddly enough, they are made from flexible vinyl like I said before, but what's unique about them is that they are comprised in four sections, two for each track. Generally, when you see this type of a layout, you have enough track on one really long segment, and then that gives you enough to wrap it around the suspension and give you your track. For this kit here, that's not the case. They are in two sections, I guess, in a way to conserve space in the box. The quality themselves are pretty good for the material that they're molded. Now, I know some people out there are watching this and they're hissing at the computer screen cause, you know, reasons. But the quality of these tracks are perfect. In my opinion, they don't need to be replaced with an aftermarket source. If I could zoom in here, you could see the quality of the grousers and the ice cleats found on the surface. On the interior, you can see the nice render detailing found on here, generally on Older kits of the past, not so much a tallery, but many other older kits. This here would be just plain, and you would just have some teeth molded into the surface. Not the case here on the tallery. They also have their wavy Panther track hinge. If anyone knows Panther hinges, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. The hinge itself is not just a single cylinder, it actually has a little schwa to it, and they have that detailing molded into the rubber. The guide horns, a little bit on the simplistic side, you don't have that little mud slip found in them, but again, because of the type of material that these are made in. More modern technology kits do have those little details found in them now, and that's just you know a sign of the era that we live in compared to when these kits here were developed. It does give you several sections of spare track. Of course, these are to be mounted on the rear racks once the vehicle gets fully painted. And of course, the other runner here is exactly the same. Grabbing this runner we have here is 
what makes this, of course, the Yag Panther. All of the runners on this particular kit are molded in this Panzer Gray polystyrene. It's the quality of the plastic is typical, again, for what you would find on a Tallery kit. And the molded and detailing is also, again, pretty much standard on what you would see. Note the detailing. I would say that's pretty crisp. It does the job. Note the fasteners found here on the engine hatch. Here's the gun barrel. It's a two-piece assembly. Pretty much standard. It does give you a pre-bent molded tow cable. Generally, I don't necessarily like when they do that, but we'll see how it fits to this vehicle. This model does have sponsons, which is a leg above the old Tamiya kits. And what's also interesting as this vehicle, as well as the other Italery Panther kit, does give you some basic interior engine compartment detailing. Here we have the Maybach HL230. Note this is the Cyclone variant, which of course is what you would expect to see on a Panther or a Yag Panther. The detailing on it is pretty good. And this is something that was actually, you know, ahead of its time. It was one of the benefits of the Italery kit versus the Tamiya. Tamiya did not have this little bit of detailing in it. And in fact, was an aftermarket component that you would have to purchase for your Tamiya tank. Italery, that wasn't the case. It came stock with the box. Now, the detailing, again, is pretty much basic. It, you have all the exterior detailing, or I should say the top half detailing for the Maybach. The rocker arm covers, the exhaust manifolds, the magnetos. Although, they kind of went with this vortexing type detailing to it because of the way everything is molded, but hey, they're there. Here we have the rear hatch, exhaust manifolds, and now this, I guess, leads us to the the top hull. Note the detailing on here, I'd say, again, pretty crisp. The torch cut lines are absent, but again, this is something that could easily be added, but you notice that the weld lines are nice and deep with their engraving, which is a nice little bit of detailing, which means that, you know, after a few coats of paint, they're not just going to blend in on you. On the rear here, you can see the fuel tank and the coolant reservoir tank. They do have some detailing found on that as well. Engine compartment is just this little cubby and doesn't go all the way into the tank. And this now takes to the grills, and this is probably one of the, I would argue, the weaker aspects of this kit. The grills are not molded all the way through, as they are found on the Tamiya kits, and also Dragon would make this correction and, and revision when they would tamper with this tooling here. Italery did went ahead and molded in some mesh detailing found on the bottom portion of the grill, which is kind of interesting because generally the mesh wouldn't be on the bottom, it's usually on the top. However, this is something that's going to be easily taken care of with a set of aftermarket photo etch, but I'll go into that after the, you know, once the build is progressed past this point. Note the fans do have their segments and they appear to be in the appropriate orientation. And again, we do have some sculpted weld beads found on all the upper extremities. From here takes us to the next runner, which is the lower half. And if anyone has watched my Dragon Vintage Panther videos, this runner here should look familiar because it makes a cameo in one or two of those videos, just illustrating exactly, it's literally the exact same tooling. So here we have the lower hull. And this is the exact same runner, of course, that's found on the Italery Panther G kit. Note the lower hull does not have the swing arms molded in and these are separate pieces that you have to glue on yourself. For some reason here, the rear half of the hull, it's just these two separate sections that you have to glue on yourself. It's kind of interesting they went with that format. To me, I don't believe they did. They just have it molded all the way through. Which means they're downside, well, not necessarily a downside, but you do have a seam to contend with. And of course, this is still present on the Dragon kits because it's the same tooling. But here you have the swing arms, the rear idler wheels, and here go the main road wheels. They do give you the rubber pattern of road wheels. If you wanted a steel pattern, well, you could either get a resin conversion set at the time or just get the dragon one, which already did that for you. But you can see the detailing found on these pieces. You would say by today's standard, they could be a bit simplistic, a little bit soft on the fasteners. But again, for 1994, this was really, you know, state of the art. There go the final drives. 
Note the little wheel, that little return roller is a separate piece that gets glued on, which is a nice touch. Go to your rear idler mounts. Various amount of hooks for the rear deck, which are easily lost, I might add, so be careful if you're building one of these. I'll touch upon that later in this video, I guarantee you. Oh, here goes the plumbing for the engine compartment. Nice little detail to drop in. Engine hatch. Inner row wheels. Note the hub detailing. Tools. And the sprockets. Rear bins. Basically, again, everything you need to get a Panther hull pretty much assembled. Thinking now further, we got here a generic set of German decals which is great, you get a few crosses and numbers from one to zero. This type of format is commonly done on many, many German tank kits on the market and for good measure. With this, it just opens up the possibilities on how you can mark your vehicle. So, standard water slide decals. They were kept, shall I say, in a not so great area of the shop. It looks like there's some kind of mildew here on the decal, so it's a good thing I'm wearing gloves. We'll see how they pan out once it comes time to the final portion of the build. A little protective tissue paper. And here go the instructions. Pretty standard for Tami or <laughs> for Tami for Italy. See how everything goes together. If anyone's ever built any of the Italy instructions before, all of this should basically come back to you. And like I frequently state, if there's any kind of a mishap or mistake with the printing on the instructions, I'll gladly point that out. Occasionally on Italy kits, I have noticed that in the past on one or two builds, but it's actually been a while since I ran into that. Engine. Yeah, basically everything you need. Now, I don't believe there are gonna be hardly any spare parts on this model. Uh, seems like what you see is what you're gonna get and what you're gonna use. And here we have the two models now, pretty much all built and at this point are ready for painting. The models went together pretty well out of the box. There are some small little quirks I want to mention with these two vehicles here and we'll be touching upon those in a moment. The first quirk I want to point out involves the bow machine gun, where we have the outer dome which is present on these types of vehicles and with the way the kit is designed the bow machine gun is actually designed to pivot and move around. The problem is with the way Italy implemented it on this kit here leaves some room to be desired. The inner ball that we have here is just not present on the stock Italy tooling and says just a big hollowed out cavity and the machine gun then pivots in that section. This really does hurt the look of the build so in order to fix it I went ahead and turned a new ball out of some resin stock and this was just fitted in place with the detailing added and by detailing I mean the hole drilled for the little optic section which are present on these machine gun balls. This does give you the missing detailing unfortunately one aspect that you will lose with this route is you lose the ability for the machine gun to freely pivot. From the machine gun ball, this now takes to the main gun. The main gun itself assembles fairly easily out of the box, but it does have some quirks to it. One of the quirks it does have is that once you assemble the unit, it wants to flop around, where it doesn't stay put in the direction where you position the gun, and it does leave a little bit of room for improvement. In order to improve this, what I went ahead and did was I took some evergreen plastic strip that was, I believe, a half inch by a sixteenth of an inch, and I cut it into the shape of a U. You can see the pictures of what this piece looks like in the corner below. And basically what this does is this becomes a lock bar and it slides into the two recesses that are found on the bottom portions of the barrel's trunnion. Once the unit gets glued in place, the unit doesn't want to wiggle around anymore and becomes much more stiffer. In order to sift it up even further, I went ahead and took some Elmer's glue and I added on the pivoting hinge sections, which once it solidifies, makes it a lot more stiffer compared to the way it would have been originally. With this setup now, you can see that the gun promptly stays in its upward direction and doesn't just want to drop down on you with the force of gravity and with the weight of the gun barrel found on the end. Now, of course, the barrel sections 
are both a two-piece assembly and there is some seam work to contend with but again this is pretty much standard on the majority of tank model kits out there. The halves line up pretty well and just polish away with some sandpaper and a few needle files. One other quirk I want to mention though with the way the gun is installed is that if you notice on this one here I don't have the barrel fitted on at this time. The way the unit is designed is that you first mount on the intersection of the barrel to the trunnion and then the mantlet here just locks it in place. At that point you can then take the second half of the barrel and then just mount it in place and now you have your completed Yag Panther. Well on this one here I built first and I actually assembled the barrel halves as one section. This is something that I generally do on most and basically all of my builds but unfortunately for me was that if you go with this route you're gonna have a problem with the mantlet because it's not gonna be able to fit over the muzzle brake. The way I was able to get this to fit was that once the the unit was assembled I actually went ahead and I had to carefully cut the muzzle brake off of the barrel end. With the muzzle brake off I was then able to install the mantlet as it would normally. Then in order to remount the muzzle brake I took a very thin plastic tube, mounted it to the barrel and then the muzzle brake just slid directly in place and the adhesives then did the rest. Once it's done at least for a nice seamless installation, but it is something that you need to pay attention to if you're working on any of these Italeri Yag Panthers, that that could be a potential problem you can encounter. In fact, I will go so far as I believe this is also a problem on not just the Italeri Yag Panther, but the Dragon and the Tamiya kits as well. And the keen eye amongst you, you'll notice that I went ahead and pre-painted the inner well sections here of the mantlet with the base coat that the vehicle will undoubtedly be painted in. This is done in order to prevent any sort of mist painted areas as you'll see that these tight confines here don't exactly allow too much room for paint to flow in there via the airbrush. This is a common trick that I do on all of my builds from 135 to 116 and yes even the 16 scale tanks have procedures that are done very similar to these. Before I went ahead and added the paint, and by the way this paint just painted on with a paintbrush, it's nice and thinned out so once the paint goes on it doesn't cause any problems. But before I did that you'll notice I went ahead and primed it with flat black spray paint. This is another trick that I use on my smaller scale static specific builds. Also if anyone's wondering well why is the barrel not yet glued onto this section here? Well that's because for this build here I have something special planned with the barrel and it would be best done as a separate part as opposed to this one here which it's going to be more or less a traditional type camouflage pattern. But of course you're going to definitely see that towards the next leg of the video where the models are going to be pre-painted and weathered. At this point I could go over more of the details but I'll be doing that after the vehicles are painted. However, before I go any further, I do want to point out the gun cleaning stave storage tube found on the side over here of this one vehicle. You see, the kit does supply you with the detailing, of course, which is quite, you know, customary on these builds. And this is what it looks like with it out of the box. Goes together pretty well, two half assembly, seam work to polish away, and then, you know, you're basically good to go. Unfortunately for this build here, for one reason or another, the one half of the barrel tubes, or I should say the stave tube section, departed to Las Partia and I was unable to track it down. So, rather than being really angry and trying to tear the place apart, I decided, you know what, I wonder if I could just scratch build it. So, I went into my plastic stock inventory and I found this piece of styrene tubing that we have here. The tubing is the exact same size of the barrel cleaning stave on the other unit, and so I just basically cut it to shape. The end sections are the kit supply ones and they went out without any problems. And the to wrap up the remainder of the detailing, the straps, which would originally been integrally molded into the other piece, were fabricated out of two thin strips of thin aluminum. They I just cut them to shape, bent them around to the correct diameter of the tube, and then glued them in the in the spots that you see here. In order to seal it off, or I should say to finish it off, I took some thin plastic angle stock that I had on hand and I mounted it in the same place where it would have been found on the original tooling. The, and to make matters even better, the angle stock is also the same size of the one on the original piece. So visually everything should be exactly where it needs to be. But one thing I want to point out is that by scratch building it, it actually makes the piece more improved because you just get some 
better detailing. Like, for instance, you can see that the piece is an actual angle and it's hollow on the inside, as opposed to the molded in one, which, you know, that gives you the shape of the angle, but it's molded solid on the ends. But, you know, have no mistakes. This one here is totally fine. So if anyone's thinking on, you know, ripping the ones off your of your Panther builds, you know, that's not necessarily the case. The kit ones work perfectly fine as is. But for this one here, it's just, you know, a happy accident that it just worked out in this order. Moving further back takes us to the engine deck. And at this point here, you can see that the photo watch has not yet been added. The photo watch is something that I add at the very end of the build. It's literally one of the last things I do before the model is finally finished off. Moving to the engine hatches, here we have the two sections. Now, these are mostly assembled out of the box components, but I am making some slight modifications to them. And if anyone's wondering, this here is the stock one, and this here is the one that I tinkered with. If anyone's wondering, well, John, they look the same. What are you adding to it? Well, that has to do with the fuel and the oil filler spouts that are found in these two locations. Here's the stock one for reference. Now, it seems that the base vehicle that Italeri must have been doing their research on was probably one that was surviving somewhere or was a museum piece because apparently the caps must have been replaced with two round plates that were bolted to the rear deck. You can see here that they have integral bolts that are molded in these four locations and on the real vehicle that's just not the case. On the real vehicle these units were removable with a, a small little wrench and that's how you're able to top off the fuel tanks. On the real tank, it's just a small little hole found in the center where the fastener would be, and those bolts are just not present. So in order to improve it, all I did was I buffed away the small little fasteners, and with a pin vise, I just added a small little hole in the center portions of the two filler caps. The same procedure is going to be done to this unit momentarily. One other thing I want to point out at this time is actually a warning in regards to the tank's instructions. You see, this model's instructions does have a typo, with the hatches on top of the vehicle. If I show the instructions, you will see here that they have the parts numbered. And unfortunately, the numbers on these parts here are actually incorrect and are inverted. If you follow the instructions, you're going to install the hatches on in reverse. The way you see it on this build here is how it's supposed to be on the Yag Panther. And I've checked this with several photographs as well as other Yag Panther builds in my collection, and they all seem to have the same format. On this side here, which would be towards the left-hand side, you would have the two mounting holes for the interior locks, and this one here would have it in the center. Well, if you follow the kit, it's going to have you mount these in reverse, which is obviously less than ideal. So much so that when I was going through the build, I actually made this mistake on this build right over here. The hatches were improperly glued on, and unfortunately I had them super glued in place, so trying to get them off was going to be a problem. Which is why, luckily, I was able to purchase this material off of Amazon. The link is found below, and if you use super glues on your build, this bottle here is going to be very, very helpful, because this dissolves super glue, but it does not harm the injection mold of plastic that the models are made in. And this stuff here worked exactly as advertised. It was perfect. I just added a couple little drops onto the areas where I know I added the glue. After 30 or 40 seconds or so, the glue started to melt and become gooey, which allowed me to remove the hatches, clean them off, and then reinstall them in the appropriate manner. This is also another reason why I don't use cements on my build, because if you accidentally make a mistake, if you're using cement, you're going to be pretty much set in stone and it's going to be irreversible. With super glue, since it does not alter the, the main material of the vehicle, you can readjust or remove something if the need ever arises with a material like this stuff here. Starting with the model suspension, all the components that you see here are the kit supplied components and were assembled out of the box. The Italeri suspension goes together very easily and pretty much effortlessly. One thing that I do want to point out involves the insulation of the sprockets. You see with the way the Italeri kit is designed, the sprocket and the final drive mounts are permanently attached, but the sprockets are still able to fully rotate. This is a design feature that's found on many Italeri tanks and is one that can lead to some problems if you go ahead and actually build it out of the box. 
where the problems come in is not exactly with the installation itself. That is actually rock solid and works pretty well. But when it comes time for mounting on the tracks, this is where you can lead to some issues because if you try to assemble the track first, remember the track itself is, you know, a, a round oval type band, you're going to need to try to fit it over the sprocket and then fit it over the rest of the wheels and then try to lock it in place with its rear idler wheel. Well, if the sprocket is in place at this time, this is going to put added stress on the axle of the sprocket and in many cases due to the stiffness of the tracks you can possibly break the axle for the sprocket which is not unfixable but now you're going to have to do a little bit more work compared to you know just building the model out of the box. Also, when you're installing the tracks in this manner, you're putting some more wear and tear on the tracks themselves, which have already at this point been painted and weathered. And the more you manhandle them, well, the more risk you have of the paint and the weathering chipping off, which can now hurt the look of the build and will lead to some further touch-ups. Which is why on these models here, what I like to do is I like to assemble them out of the box, but when it comes time for the sprockets, I do not install them to the final drives with the kit supplied method. Instead, the final drives are installed to the tank and then the sprockets are left loose. When the time comes to install the sprockets with the track, I basically take the sprocket, loop it around the track, and then I insert everything in one shot over the row wheels and the sprocket then aligns into its corresponding hole. This is probably one of the best ways to install a single piece final track on a model like this. While on that topic, this leads us to the tracks. The tracks that you see on this model are the kit supply tracks and were utilized out of the box with literally no problems. Like what was showcased earlier in the unboxing portion, one unique feature that's found on the Italeri pattern of Panther and Yank Panther kits is that the tracks are in four segments. So you have two segments to put together in order to get the long band required in order to loop it around the rest of the suspension. This is a bit of a departure which is typically seen on tanks where the bands are already at their appropriate length and you just connect them together at one point. On the model here, the track section just went together without any problems. A small little dropper glue of course was used and then a soldering iron was used just to melt the little tabs in their appropriate places. This is basically part and parcel for single piece type tracks. Then the track bands went on without any sort of problems. One thing that that you have to do on a on a vehicle like this is that you have to glue the top portions of the wheels to the track in order to achieve that sag effect which is something that is done on all single piece vinyl tracks regardless of the make be it from a tallery like this one here or even the other kits from Tamiya. Of course this would also include some of the newer Dragon kits which give you a single piece of vinyl track. The tracks cemented in their appropriate locations and again the tracks just went on without any problems. Like I may have mentioned earlier, these Italeri kits have this rough opinion on them on the armor modeling forums as well as in the community in general, mostly amongst smug armor modeling elitists, but generally they claim that these tracks are really really bad and you know they have a litany of problems, but as you can see from these two builds here, the tracks went out without any problems and well they fit the build quite well. In my opinion, the kit supply tracks are more than suffice for the task at hand, so much so that the need to acquire an aftermarket source is just not necessary. Now, of course, if anyone's watching this and want to level up one of these older kits here with a set of workable track links from one make or another, that, of course, is an option and will yield for some pretty decent results, but in my opinion, it's just really not worth it. While on the topic of the tracks, one last thing I want to mention is with the way they are painted. In the past, I used to use just El Cheapo flat black rattle can spray paints in order to paint my single piece vinyl tracks of one flavor or another, be it Tamiya, Tallery, AV Club, whatever. In recent years, I found out that the composition used in the spray paints have changed over the last couple decades and because of that you run the risk of possibly causing harm to the tracks. At first you'll be able to paint the tracks and they'll go on the model just fine. However, as the model ages, the Paints can have a lasting effect on the material used in the vinyl tracks and after a while they can cause them to brittle up and fall apart. If this does happen on you, well of course you can just swap this out for a set of workable track links. But in order to hedge and prevent that, on these models here the tracks are painted via an airbrush and the base coat is just Tamiya flat black. I've mentioned this on many of my other smaller scale build videos and for good reason. The Tamiya flat black from what I've seen ages extremely well with the 
stock material that's found on these tracks here. And as the model ages, the Tamiya paint will not have any lasting effects on the material, which can cause them to disintegrate as if they would if they had some kind of chemical reaction with the other paints that I just mentioned. So as a rule of thumb, if you are working on one of these 135s that have tracks like this, go with Tamiya Flat Black or a similar color of Tamiya Dark Gray color of your choice in order to prevent the tracks from possibly causing harm and giving you a headache down the road. One last thing I want to mention before I depart from the suspension involves weathering of the road wheels. You'll notice that on this model here, and just like many other models that are showcased on this channel, I weather them to have the bearings have you look that they're worn out and they're leaking. This is something that can easily happen and often does happen in field. And when it does, they're not exactly replaced all that often. In order to do this, I just basically take a paintbrush with some gloss black and I add the starburst effects on some various locations. In order to really make it shine further upon the gloss black, I take some Tamiya gloss lacquer and I go over some of these locations and this gives you a secondary effect and it really does make the piece look nice and wet like you see it here in the light. However, one thing I do want to point out is that you want to have the, the mindset that you, not all of the wheels are going to have bearings that blow and when they blow they're not going to start dripping all that often. So you want to have a mix of this type of effect across your suspension set. If you notice like on this side over here there's only like two or three of the wheels that have this type of a weathering and also no, no two of them of course look alike. And some of the wheels are left completely intact because well their bearings haven't went yet. So this is something to keep in mind when you're weathering not just a Panther like this but basically any other type of military or even tracked vehicle. Carrying on now takes to the rear plate of the models. Both of these models utilize these stock components and were pretty much assembled out of the box. On the exhaust manifolds, they are very nicely detailed, but they come in a two-piece assembly, which is similar to what you'll see, of course, on the gun barrel. This type of assembly is also common on other 135th scale Panther and Yag Panther kits that are on the market, and in order to build them, you just have some small seam work to contend with. Once the seam work is polished away with a little bit of sandpaper and some glue, the pieces will have the seamless look that we have here, which is an easy way to help the look of your model. Bouncing to the front of the model takes to the nose as well as to the other recesses where the upper and lower hulls fit. Of course, with the way the kit is designed, you are going to have some slight seams found in these locations. These are easily addressed with some basic glues, sandpapers, as well as even a little bit of putty to act as bodywork. Once all of the sanding and polishing is removed, the model is going to have the appropriate appearance that you're looking for. However, one thing that I do want to mention involving the bodywork involves the two puzzle pieces that we have here on the front. With the way the bodywork is done, and by the time you're done with all the sanding and polishing, these areas here can easily be subdued due to the amount of sanding required in order to just blend everything in. In order to keep everything nice and crisp, after the bodywork was concluded, I went in here with a Dremel with a small bit, and I re-etched the weld beads, as well as even added some of the torch cut lines that were polished away. One thing that I did notice when assembling both of these kits is that the way the kits are designed, you're not going to have really a whole lot of fit issues, so the models do to go together in pretty much a nice streamlined manner. Moving up takes us to the side hull and starting with the side hull detailing. For this one here, there's nothing really much to talk about. All the detail components are the kit supply parts and were simply mounted out of the box. The cleaning stave tube was the kit original, and this one did receive a small amount of bodywork in order to flare in the two halves together, which is again customary on these Panther or Yag Panther kits. Where the real interesting bit comes in is with the second Yag Panther, and this is something that I touched upon earlier during the build portion of this video. This is the one that had to have been completely scratch built because one of the tube halves went off to Lost Partia. Now that the model is fully painted and weathered, you can see how well the piece blends in and arguably probably looks more realistic compared to the other one due to the fact that the straps are clearly distinctive and are molded into the piece as well as that triangular stock that we have here running along the top. If I could try to get the other one side by side, hopefully this gives you a good idea exactly how well the replacement unit came out. 
Bring us to the opposite side of the model, there's nothing really much to talk about. All the kit supply components were utilized and they went on without any problems. This now brings us to the rear edge index of these two builds. Now that the models are fully complete, you can see what they look like with the photo wedge sets. Like I said before, one of the weaker aspects of these Italeri Panther kits involves the grill work. With the way they are molded, this can hurt the look because they are molded flat and you can't exactly see into the vehicle as you would on the real tank. On these models over here, by adding the photo wedge grill work, this does a good job in obscuring the blocked off bottom portion of the model. But you could take that to the next level by doing what I did here and adding the other grill sliding covers that go over the mesh work. By adding these details, this completely obliterates the original grill work being left exposed, but you're doing it by not exactly ruining the model because, well, these details here are present on the real vehicles. Of course, one really cool aspect that the Italeri Panther family has over some of the other ones on the market is with the engine hatch itself. Like I showcased earlier, the hatches are fully functional where you can prop them open via the hinge in order to get access to the Maybach HL230 or you can just straight up remove the entire rear engine plate like I did over here. The engines, like I may have mentioned before, are built completely stock out of the box and nothing was done to them outside of painting them with their appropriate colors and then fully masking them so that everything is protected when the rest of the model goes into its paint, camouflage, and weathering. The kits are nicely engineered in that the pieces just go on in their appropriate locations with no hand fitting required. And the hinges are fully functional but like I may have mentioned before are a bit on the fragile end so when you're working on one of these models take your time and you don't want to rush these pieces so that you don't cause any damage to the small little hinge work. If the hinges break in one portion or another, your functional hinge system is going to be pretty much toast. From the rear deck, this now takes to the escape hatches. These are the same units that I mentioned before and are fully functional as they are on most of the Yag Panthers that are on the market. Aside from the escape hatches, you can see the antenna bases. These are the kit supplied ones. What I went ahead and did was I just drilled them out with a pin vise in order so I can add on a piece of thin wire and in my usual format the antennas are painted with the exact same method. The antenna wire themselves are flat black, the little mid section here is painted in brass and the bottom portion would be rubber so I went ahead and painted that with Timia rubber black. If anyone have ever watched my other German World War II AV videos this procedure here is basically copy and paste. Moving forward takes to the main guns. These are the same components that I mentioned in the earlier scene, but now that they are fully painted and weathered, you can see how the paint looks on top of the molded cast texturing that is found on the kit surface. While on that note, you can see on the bow machine guns how the cast texturing looks after the vehicle is fully painted and weathered, along with that fabricated machine gun ball that I mentioned earlier. This now brings us to the paint and the markings. Just like with the other double feature model showcase videos that are seen on this channel, I wanted these two models to be painted very differently from one another in order to have just some differentiation in my collection. Let me go ahead and temporarily move this one out of the way to focus on the vehicle in the foreground. For this build over here, I wanted to go as traditional as possible, so I went with your standard tried and true German three-tone camouflage pattern. The pattern itself was applied via the airbrush, as were the washes that went on in order to bring the model up to the look that you see here. The remainder of the weathering was done with the dry brushing techniques that I've touched upon in other videos on this channel in the past. For the other model, however, I wanted to do something a little bit different, and I was a little bit more experimental on this one. Rather than your typical German three-tone camouflage pattern, I wanted this one to look a little bit more weathered and war-torn. For this build here, I had the idea of basically a tank that was built up from spare parts that were salvaged from other knocked-out German Jagdpanthers. In order to get this look, what I went ahead and did was I first painted the tank with a German three-tone camouflage scheme, but rather than your standard yellow majority base coat and camouflage pattern that's seen on this vehicle here, I went with a green dominant camo pattern, which was a camo that was a legit pattern and was utilized on several Yag Panthers during World War II. From there, I wanted to go ahead and replicate the mix and match look that I just touched upon. First and foremost, the barrel is left in its primer gray, which is a 
feature that was seen on many German vehicles of the period. Something like this was a somewhat common occurrence. If the gun's original barrel would be damaged or has to be replaced for one reason or another, in most cases, the barrel would have the factory original gray primer finish that you see it here. Very rarely would the crews go ahead and have the opportunity to go ahead and throw the colors on it to make it match with the rest of the vehicle. However, I didn't want to stop with painting the barrel just gray because that is something that I've done on several other builds on this channel and it's one that, you know, it does look very good, but I wanted for this build to go a little bit further. And that's where we go to some of the other components that are found in this build. If you look carefully, you'll see that some of the components are not just of a completely different camouflage pattern, but are also using different colors compared to the remainder of the vehicle. If I just bring your attention to the road wheels, for instance, the mantlet, some random pieces of hatches as well as even fenders, not to mention of course the rear engine hatch area. You'll notice that on this vehicle here the tank that these parts would have originally came from was one that well had an octopus or a bubble type pattern. By doing this, these two patterns are literally completely different from each other and it's one that I wanted to incorporate on this build to really give it that you know, junkyard repair type look. Also, in a way to really make the pieces look as different as possible, I went ahead and weathered them differently as well. On the remainder of the tank itself, you'll notice that the vehicle is heavily faded compared to even some of my other builds. However, on the other components, they are weathered in a slightly different manner, which is a way to give contrast between these two camouflage patterns. Just like with the other model, this one here utilized similar painting techniques by using both the airbrush as well as dry brushing for the weathering. On the sections that are painted with the octopus pattern, the octopuses are hand painted on with a paintbrush, which is the same technique that I utilize on other vehicles in my collection that have a similar type of camouflage scheme. For the markings, both of these builds utilize the kit supply of water slide decals. For this one here, I went with a more minimalistic type setup where the only markings that the vehicle has are the two German crosses that are found on either side of the fighting compartment. While on the more traditional build, well, I went with a more traditional layout for the markings. This would include both the crosses as well as the numbers. The quality of the water slide decals on these two builds were actually pretty good. I had no problems with adding the decals to the water and then sliding them onto their appropriate locations. Once they were fully dried, I went ahead and sealed them all with the VMS varnish. This was something that was different compared to some of the other builds that I've done in the past, where I use a different type of a lacquer, and on those builds, you run the risk of potentially having some decal shine and or silvering. With the VMS varnish, that's just not the case. The varnish does a much better job in sealing everything to the surface and really doing a good job of matting them out and removing as much shine or silvering as possible. Overall, the VMS varnish, like I've mentioned in many of my other recent videos, is highly recommended for anyone out there who's doing any type of models, but AAV specific. At the end of the day, I'm really happy in how these two turned out. These two builds here were sitting in the stash for far too long, so finally having them and getting them completed and scratched off the to-do list, it's one that always does feel rewarding. We now go towards skill level and recommendations. The Italeri Jag Panthers, in my opinion, build into a very nice representation of the vehicle in question. These kits here aged very well and are as viable today as they were all those years ago when they first came out. Of course, if anyone is looking for a 135th scale Jag Panther, it seems as if you are awash with tons and tons of different kit options and offerings from a multitude of companies. Some of the newer kits, are going to be considerably more advanced compared to the older models that we have here. However, there is something to be said about simplicity. With these models, they do tend to build quicker and require a little less effort to put together compared to some of the more super kits, which give you some very nice details, but this comes at the cost of added complexity. As simplistic as these two kits are, I really can't recommend them for the beginner model builder. If you're the type of person who never built a plastic model kit before, but are looking to enter into the armor modeling hobby, these two models here are really not your best choice for an entry level kit. Because of this vehicle's interloven wheel design, not to mention some of the other small, finely molded detail bits that I mentioned earlier, these 
features are going to potentially lead to frustration for the beginner model builder. Something like this would be best done as a second or third build where you've already built up some of the experience with working with basic detail parts, but are looking to advance into something that has a little bit more complexity, but something that's not nearly as complicated or as complex as some of the other more modern kits that I just mentioned. This is why I would recommend these kits here for anyone who's an intermediate to an advanced range builder. By the time you would be an intermediate builder, you've already mastered some of the techniques such as bodywork, seam removal, as well as even just handling small, finely molded detail parts. And obviously, if you're an advanced range builder, you could tackle one of these models probably with your eyes closed. These two kits build extremely well out of the box, however are a great platform in which you can add further detailed aftermarket components of one flavor or another. One benefit that the Yag Panther does have is that there is a humongous inventory out there on the aftermarket scene of detail components in a ton of different offerings. From photo etch to cast resin, CNC, workable track links, new replacement wheels, you name it, there are a ton of parts out there that can be added to these kits here in order to spice them up compared to the stock original offering. If there was one detail accessory that I would strongly recommend, it would of course be the addition of the photo etch grill work that I mentioned earlier in this video for the, well, the same reasons that I've already discussed. This kit here I would recommend for anyone who's an avid fan of the German Zoo. Basically, anyone who's a World War II German tank fan would really appreciate the addition of this Jag Panther to their collection. However, while on that note, one person who I would not necessarily recommend this kit to would be anyone who is a super diehard Panther fan. I'm talking about the type of person who knows every single weld, rivet, bolt, accessory, who made it, who casted it, who machined it. If you're one of those type of individuals, perhaps this kit here might not necessarily tick your boxes. A person like this would probably appreciate more some of the more modern super kits that I mentioned earlier, where they do have a higher level fidelity in terms of the detailing that you're desiring. These kits here, I would guess, are more along the lines of someone who's looking for a just a generic Yag Panther build, and are someone that can appreciate the details that are found on this kit here, but knowingly that there are much better options on the market available to them. Aside from that type of a detail perfectionist, these kits here would be greatly appreciated by anyone who, again, just wants to collect and build up a number of German vehicles in their collection. On that note, if you're the type of person that just loves the Panther or the Yagd Panther, but are not nearly as obsessed as the other individual I just mentioned, these kits here would be recommended as well. These kits here I would also recommend for someone who's into making dioramas. Because of the engine compartment interior detailing, perhaps this should be something that would give this kit a bit of an edge compared to some of the other offerings on the market that are just generally exterior models only. Although these kits are getting on the older end, they're not necessarily considered to be vintage tank kits. Well, at least not yet anyhow. Having said that, however, there is some collectability to them. If anyone is a fan of building and collecting Italian plastic model kits, these kits here would fit right into that collection. And with that, that wraps up this double feature model showcase video for these two 135th scale German Yak Panther tank destroyers. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content being small scale model showcase videos like these two over here or the other larger scale project update videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in the loop of new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There I have more photographs of these two models as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have already been posted on this channel. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by EastCoastArmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. See you on the next one. Take care.